Hello. <laughs> hey, hey. Hello. Hello. Hey. Uh, welcome. So, this is Containers from the Couch. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. If you were here yesterday, you got to see our friend Jesse Below uh, demo at Mesh, and he did an amazing job. And we're going to go another step further today and do some more in depth, uh, deep dives into at mesh and do some cool things. So I'm not going to say much more there, but um, if you're not familiar with, with the show and what we do, uh, we talk all things containers on AWS containers in general. So um, yeah, Brent, yeah. anything you want to add? No, I think that's a, that's definitely a good start. I tweeted out uh, earlier this morning, you know, kind of what we were going to be talking about. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, I actually kind of got the list a bit wrong. Uh, so we're going to look at using app mesh to solve, you know, a bunch of different problems that, uh, that a lot of people have in their stack. Like how do I, uh, you know, improve observability? So, uh, we'll take a look at that and then, you know, how do I, you know, extrapolate out a feature that I end up needing to do over and over and over in all of my different uh, languages across all of my different services. Let's just extrapolate that out and put it in at mesh retries is the, is the example there. And then there's a new feature that we just released for at mesh uh, to help you get your traffic into the mesh as early as possible. And that's uh, using ingress uh, for app mesh. So uh, we just released that feature. Was it this week or last week? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, it was this week. This week. So this week. Uh, current events with containers <laughs> from the couch. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll be taking a look at how how to set that up and how to start using that. So Jesse's here to walk us through all that stuff. And um, yeah, Jesse, take it away. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me again. This is a lot of fun. Um, you're right, that song, that like intro song really gets in your head. Uh, I'm still bopping. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's not that you got a, a list wrong. Uh, there's just so many features. And like we talked about yesterday, there's so many problems that you can solve um, with the service mesh and with, with that mesh in particular. So um, I just prepped out a few things to walk through uh, ingress uh, with virtual gateways is definitely one of the ones that I want to show because I think it solves some really um, simple problems, right? So how do you how do you get uh, traffic into your application, and then how do you uh, sort of ensure that you see that north south uh, traffic, see the benefits of uh, app mesh, uh, just like your east west traffic inside your mesh does. So. And I, yeah. yesterday I saw somebody who wasn't you mean. familiar. Yeah. I was Sorry, what is say. north, south, and east, west? Yeah. I know. So I've, I've been abusing that uh, vernacular for a while now, and I realize not everybody gets it. So um, so when we're talking about inter-service uh, or you know, service uh, traffic between your microservices and your application, we talk about east, east, west traffic. So that's sort of between the services inside your cluster. And when we talk about things like API gateways and um, sort of things coming in from the edge into your cluster, we're talking about sort of north and then south for egress, so you know, north, north, south. <laughs> so yeah, the arrows are really difficult, right? Um, so so that's north, south, right? So like if you just think about it, sort of in a stack, right? Your clusters here, east, west traffic between your between your services, and then north, south coming in and out. Um, and so the you know the mesh uh, we use the same terminology. So when you have mesh components uh, you know communicating with each other, we're talking east-west traffic and and um, virtual gateways in that mesh, which is the new feature that we released this week, um, uh, bring sort of north north-south traffic to the party. Um, so as you you might uh, you know allocate a load balancer um, and bring traffic into your application that way. So when you define and specify a virtual gateway as part of your mesh, it will automatically provision an NLB for you and will configure it uh, based upon the, the virtual gateway configuration. So it's really cool. And you know we see a lot of, of services uh, that exist solely to be front ends. Um, and so this is, a, we'll actually look at a demo here um, that uh, might be stalled out. 
I hear you. Can so you hear you can me? Okay. Talking if you want. I'll keep on talking. I'll keep but talking. But your video is is uh, paused for some reason. Interesting. And while he's working, I do want to add something that, you know, it, going along with what Jesse was saying. So generally, you know, previous prior to uh, the virtual gateway um, support being released in app mesh, um, you had to write your own front end service. You had to think of a load balancer, right? You had to make sure that that front end service had some load balancer configured to ingress and then, then basically talk to your backend microservices. Now, you know, you can control all of these components with your mesh. So whereas you may have been controlling in two places, now you're controlling in one. And I know Jesse just dropped, I'm sure he'll be back momentarily. He's totally. in Maine. So I think like the, the, the connection just takes a while from Maine. Yeah, it's, it's very north, south and <laughs> east, west. So. I'm not sure. But as you can see, I, I have this containers from the couch box right in my face right here. Oh, so. Right, right, right. Here, but let, I, me, let me take care of that for you. Oh, we'll my just go goodness. there. We'll just do that. Beautiful. So, Brent, while we're waiting, like, let's let's talk about that. Let's talk about, um, you know, deploying applications, you know, your microservice applications. Previously, you have all your back end services. Let's say you, you meshified them, but your mm -hmm. front end couldn't necessarily fit in the mesh, right? Yeah, so that was actually a problem that this this project was trying to solve is uh, getting the getting the co the traffic into the mesh as soon as possible, um, and that can help. For you know, anytime you start to do observability and you start to do um, you know, like we were just talking about retries and stuff like that, uh, the earlier you can get all of that going and and the decision making process around north, south, and east, west, and, and stuff like that, have all of that uh, be part of your mesh, the better off you'll end up being. So I see Jesse's back. Welcome back. I'm OK. I wanted to see it. Like, if I am I lurking, or am I actually back? Yeah, um, the, the whole browser system just crashed on me. So I'm that back. Happens. Sorry about I that. Just, I envision like a lobster just snip the, the fiber. We're, yeah. we're right next to your house. Lobster. <laughs> that'd, that'd be ideal, right? Just wandering up. Uh, yeah. He's in Maine. That's just like a Maine I'm joke. In Maine, that yeah. That's all <laughs> yeah. I got, guys. That worked. So uh, uh, let's. I see you have a screen shared. Should we? Should we go to that? We can. Yeah, I, I have uh, just a couple of quick diagrams. This is this is not a slideshow uh, webinar type thing, but I do like diagrams for describing things sometimes. Yeah. And so the app we're going to deploy. Uh, looks like this. So it's called Color App. It's another one of our demo applications, which is, like we said yesterday, meant to be very simple, uh, really great application for showing uh, some of the App Mesh features. So uh, we're going to use this today. And one of the first things we'll do is deploy a virtual gateway. So we can see right here uh, off the bat, we have an architecture in our existing app that can benefit, right? We have a load balancer. Uh, traffic coming in for our, from our clients into a front-end service, uh, literally called Gateway. Uh, and then that is responsible for passing traffic off to um, various back-end instances of a service called Color Teller. So those are all configured to return a particular color, right, as a string. And so you can see we, we, um, we pass in a request. And right now, the, the default behavior is based on uh, header content. So you set a header value for, say, blue, and you'll get back a string that's blue. So it shows you know, just this sort of very basic microservice uh, application architecture. And cool. so if we, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great little app for, for having moving parts and doing various things with. Yeah. So, um, but sorry. So no, uh, go ahead. Go I was just going to address one of the questions here. Texan Raj, uh, welcome back, by the way. Uh, can you guys also compare and contrast between App Mesh versus Glue versus Istio? Uh, when do you use which one? Um, I'll take that one if if you guys don't mind. But uh, for me, I actually use App Mesh first, and if I can't, that for for whatever reason, that's when I'll start to investigate uh, Glue or Istio after that. So um, and and the decision tree for me starts with uh, what do I want to be responsible for? 
And uh, the responsibility of running Glue and of running Istio is all on me. And so I have to be you know, an expert at it and have to understand all of the different components and pieces of it and, and how it works. And when it comes time to upgrade, I have to like follow the correct procedure and, and be familiar with, you know, doing that correctly. And if it breaks, I have to know what to troubleshoot and where to look. Uh, with App Mesh, none of that happens. So I'm only responsible for making sure that the auto injector can inject the sidecar and that I have my namespaces labeled correctly and that I configure things uh, correctly. So um, I, I can handle all of that. that. That's a much easier thing to, to take care of or more importantly, be able to pass off to uh, another team. So that's, that's my decision tree. But if for some reason, like maybe I'm running in my own data center, um, in that case, you know, App Mesh today isn't really available for that today. Um, so it, I think it would be really cool to then explore uh, a different mesh because meshes are worth using. So if you if you get a system, you know, a set of services going that is at all complicated, uh, then you definitely will want to be using a mesh because they all end up doing, you know, some variation of these features that we're going to talk about today. So, um, so yeah, definitely check out whatever mesh uh, you makes you the happiest. But for me, that happens to be App Mesh, and I'm not saying that because I work at Amazon. I'm, I'm actually uh, that's just the way I think and the way I try and build things. And if I could just, yeah, I, I love that, Brent, because this is, to me, when I'm building an AWS, when I, my first thought is always, is there a service that manages what I'm trying to do? I want to use that if I can. And, and it goes beyond just the mesh, right? This is just really anything you're building is, can I take that, that heavy lifting and offload it to AWS? Now, yeah. I want to test it. If it works, great. Now, if it doesn't work for our use case, that's when you start to look at, you know, building something on your own and then taking on that that heavy lifting because you have to. I right? look at it as a people problem too. You know, how big does my team have to be or have to grow in order to support this additional uh, level of complexity? And um, when I'm using App Mesh, it, it, that number is basically zero because the App Mesh team is there. They're my team, right? So, and I don't have to pay them. Um, you know, they're there all, all the time monitoring uh, the App Mesh service and, and uh, writing additional features for it and improving it along the way. And, and if anything goes wrong, I can open a ticket. I can, you know, call my uh, service people. I can get, I can, you know, get things moving very quickly. And not only that, because App Mesh is uh, a multi-tenant control plane, um, if something goes wrong, it's very likely going wrong for every customer in the region. And so, you know, that team's already on top of it, fixing things and and uh, making it better. So there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits there that uh, that I can just take advantage of. And if I recall correctly, does anyone remember how much App Mesh is? Is it is it zero? I didn't know if yeah. I could say the F word. It's it's free. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, it's you know you we're we're giving you all of that uh, benefit and all of that expertise, and it's just built into uh, built into your account. So why not take advantage of it? So again, that's my starting point, and then after that, that's when I look at taking on the additional risk and the additional responsibility right. so, if App Mesh doesn't work for me. So there is a good point. Let's let's call ourselves out here. So the service, the managed service, and all of the aspects of what you just said is absolutely true. And it and it comes as as part of your uh, sort of the 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 core service, right? We see this as um, a solution that everyone can benefit from. Customers, all of our customers have these problems, so we want to fix them. We want to help you fix them. Now, that said, when you watch these demos today, and if you were tuned in yesterday, you know that we're running containers, right? And to enable this solution, we're running more containers. So there is some resource cost to it. And I just want to call that out that it's really quite minimal. Um, and you know, the, the thing is, is you have to contrast the complexity you bring um, 
to to a solution and the resources you expend, uh, you know, to so, to resolve situations that based upon what that situation is and and what your problems really are. So one of the the stories that I think of is I, I talked to a customer once and they were running Istio on multiple clusters, multiple actually hundreds of microservices across a few applications, and really they they were using it. Um, for a very simple, um, so basically they were they were using it to to uh, introspect the traffic coming in and tag certain resources for internal ingestion. That was it. And I said, what? Well, that might be a that might be an option where you actually do write a service for that, right? And and surely they yeah. they did, and they actually just removed SDO because they weren't using it for anything else. So I think there there is a flip side to that coin and saying. You know, these are all problems that you might have. Stop and think if you do have them, right? And if you do, then think, well, what's going to address them the best? You know, we yeah. uh, another thing that sort of tickled my my uh, I wanted to reply to in that question is, um, you know, having Istio and Glue in the same comparative sense. So, do we use this or Istio mm -hmm. or Glue? Istio and Glue are very different, and they can solve the same problems if your problem is the same, but they have very different feature sets uh, so that there are other problems that, that can be solved outside the scope of either. Um, and I think app mesh is like that too. And one of the things that we touched on yesterday is, is it's really meant to generally solve a host of problems on all of the compute environments that you might be deploying your work in, in AWS. So that's really the goal of app mesh is if, if you're building on, on AWS, like Adam pointed out, this is a great solution. It's there for you, and uh, hopefully, you know, we can see past some of the complexity and realize it. It might be worth it, right? Uh, so, yeah. Should we awesome. should we walk through some some gateway stuff here? I think we should. Okay. Do so, it do, do it live. So, so this is this is the application as we talked about before. And so, if we add a few uh, pieces of of configuration to our application. Um, this is what it looks like in App Mesh. And so over here at the very end, oops, over here at the very end, we still have, you know, this this is basically representative of what you just saw here. So these are the, the services and pods, the things that are running in the cluster. And everything over this way, this is all App Mesh. This is for the most part, uh, you know, abstractions and configuration constructs. Some of these are represented uh, in the cluster by uh, proxy instances that are running, as we talked about yesterday. So for example, the new virtual gateway feature, which is what actually provides the ingress, uh, is a single instance of an Envoy proxy. Um, and then when you get here, this is actually a complete abstraction. This is just configuration, which points at the processes that are running here. So, uh, and then obviously you get an Envoy proxy injected into these pods. So um most of this is really conceptual stuff but the idea here is that your traffic comes in from clients into your gateway uh your gateway can route to your services which then pick up where we were talking about yesterday where your virtual routers can then define the path of your traffic so and again, in this, this example we're going to do looks like we're doing path-based routing or is it going to be uh, so, header based so this is the neat thing about this is that it's very simple to define either of those. And in fact, in the in the demo we're going to do in just a second, we'll replace this uh, header-based gateway service with a virtual gateway that'll do header-based routing and also add a path-based one. Oh, so we okay, can actually, cool. yeah, so we can, uh, in one fell swoop, we can sort of uh, sunset a service and end of life it and add functionality just with like some some YAML, which which is always good, right? <laughs> so we let's let's peek at the YAML. So yes. um, so I did set this up ahead of time just to to save time. Um, so we had talked about some of the the basic stuff yesterday. So I won't go over that again with the virtual nodes and services. But the virtual gateway is is part of the new feature that we just released this week. So this is how you define uh, for EKS. Um, a virtual gateway. And it's very similar um, to some of the other things we were talking about yesterday around how a mesh identifies with a namespace. There is uh, there are match labels here for the gateway and the namespace. Let me let me uh, ask a point a clarifying question. 
you said for EKS, but this is really applicable to any Kubernetes running in AWS, right? It really is. Thanks for thanks for catching me on that. We we use those interchangeably for a reason, it's... Uh, because EKS is just Kubernetes, right? So yeah, I often say uh, say EKS. Yeah, this this will run on. Uh, this is yeah, this is good for any Kubernetes uh, self managed uh, running on EC2 wherever it happens to be. Um, cool. And then so yeah, just to to summarize the 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 new features here. So we have virtual gateways and then we have the gateway routes and the gateway routes are affiliated with the gateway and they're the pieces of configuration that you specify your, your ingress routing with. And so you can see here, uh, we have uh, a path that we're introducing called headers and then another one uh, called paths. And of course the headers will point off to a virtual service called color headers and the virtual that the paths will point off to a virtual service called color paths. And those in turn will have router definitions to route our traffic as we want. Fair enough. Fantastic. And it looks like right, Brent's cool back. Stuff. Brent disappeared for a moment. I saw that, yeah. Oh, we can... but his, his volume. Uh oh. Having technical difficulties, but we're gonna keep it going. Yes. As long as we don't all three have technical difficulty. <laughs> I don't know. It then, seems like it's going in order here. So I'm next. Every, uh, oh, I totally messed something up there. I forgot I wrapped this whole thing in a deploy script. <laughs> nice. And so what are you doing here? What What's happening in this deploy script? So, yes. Yeah, so I'm building, well, I've already built the, the images uh, for our services. And I created an ECR repository and pushed the images to the uh, to that repo. And then I've created all of the things that were in our manifest. We see I've created a namespace, create a mesh. So this is very similar to what we did yesterday. We're adding the virtual gateway and gateway routes. Um, are you back, Brent? Nope, you're not back. Oh, dear. All right, so it's we okay. can just take a we can take a peek in here um, and just see all of the things that we deployed. Um, and like yesterday, you know, there's there's a lot of moving parts, but again, keeping in mind that a lot of this uh, is you know your your configuration rather than actual running processes. So uh, a lot of these things are are virtual constructs, um, and then we have you know our familiar native. Uh, uh, Kubernetes objects or deployments and such. And note, we do have our um, uh, containers are running, you know, uh, our, rather our microservices running in their pods have sidecar con uh, containers injected. Uh, and so we actually have also enabled X-Ray in this namespace, which we'll get to in a few. So we actually have um, not only the, in this example, the blue color app, container in this pod, but we also have an X-ray daemon and we also have the Envoy proxy running. And that is also all managed by um, the controller that we talked about yesterday. And actually, so yeah, Brent just posted the question, when I define an yep. ingress gateway, does this also create an ALB? Uh, it creates an NLB actually. Yep. And so yeah. it will automatically provision an NLB for you and configure it and uh, stand it up on the old internet, which we should be doing right now. Um, and you know, so, uh, earlier there was a question from Texan Raj about how do you monitor north, south, east, west traffic in EKS and make decisions accordingly. So I think going into X-ray here, we're going to get a, some good insight into how to how to monitor that. So it's coming soon. And by the way, you can hear me now, right? Yep. Yes. You sound terrific. Yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> We have to wait for uh, for DNS to re to resolve uh, on a brand new load balancer. So, and this is like I, I feel like if I were to add up all the time I was waiting for for DNS and load balancers, um, I would you know like get a year back of my life. It's <laughs> it's crazy how long that I shouldn't make fun. I'm not making fun. It it <laughs> takes that long for a good reason. I just don't know what it is. So. Um, 
I did want to point out too that that the controller has has taken care of our configuration and reflected those changes in the app mesh API. So we actually have a new mesh that stood up in in the service, um, and we can look at actually that new uh, the new service uh, the new feature. So we have a virtual gateway that's established, and then there are gateway routes on that as well. Um, yeah, it's a good point. If, if if you happen to not catch the show yesterday. We talked about the controller, the app mesh controller, and how it abstracts creating all of these resources from you, and the controller handles all that. So this is really cool. Right. There so we go. I just wanted to point out. So the original application, remember, had the you know it take the the header value uh, and and return you know the the response, and we deprecated that service, but we also added the paths. Uh, base, so you can actually come in on a on a path space API, and uh, and get your values as well as the original uh, behavior, which which was header based. So that was fairly simple to do in in YAML, which I think is really impressive. Totally. So that yeah. So you had backwards compatibility. You basically you deployed the virtual gateway, so it was backward compatible and forwards compatible with right. the, the new features. That's amazing. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, anytime you can take, you so anytime you can EOL code that you, that you own is, is probably good. Right. Yeah. Um, totally. <laughs> yeah. I, I love deleting code. Uh, Texan Raj had a question. How many sidecars is enough per pod? And I, I hear a little bit of snark in that question, but I get it. And then I think the real question, is there a performance hit? Um, I, I'm going to say no, there's not a performance hit just on the surface of like not just because you have sidecars, but uh, one of the advantages that sidecars brings to the table is uh, all of the communication within a pod can happen over localhost or over the loopback interface. And being able to do that in, in, in this case, for example, like with Envoy, we can configure the back end for Envoy, to, you know, which is our actual application, to just be localhost. So, you know, it's it's an easy, predictable location to always find whatever your resource happens to be. So if you have like a, a metrics agent or log agent or something like that, you know, also as a sidecar, you'll know you can always pump your metrics or your logs to localhost and it'll reach that agent at the right location and, and the agent will be able to act accordingly. So as far as a performance hit, no, I mean, you're taking up more resources. So there might be a cumulative effect if you're, if you're you know, at the edge of your cluster sizing, but the, right. no, there shouldn't be a direct performance hit because you have sidecars. Right, and also just like, let's loop back on on some good advice. You use this when you need it. Right. So if you don't want to use X-Ray or for that example, we're just using X-Ray as an example. We have integrations with Zipkin Jaeger. We have integration with Datadog and other third party providers. So just as an example for tracing, if you don't want to use that, then you just don't enable it. Uh, you know, but the, the point here is, is that you do have some of these problems that you want to solve, which we'll talk about. And this is a fairly easy way to bring it to the party. Um, you know your alternative here, if you want to, if you want to integrate X-ray tracing with your containers, you're just going to do this by hand and still run the sidecar, right? This is not a, this isn't a side effect of how App Mesh wants to integrate with X-ray. This is App Mesh automating the X-ray integration for you. If that made sense. Yep, made sense to me. Cool. All right. So I just wanted to point out this. These are the the containers that are running in any one of those given application pods. You have the app service, which is running, uh, and your Envoy proxy. And then, as we said, we have the X-Ray daemon. Um, so each of those has that. Um, so yeah, let's let's actually look at the integration with um, some of the services. So like I said, we, we have uh, sort of a, a number of different integrations for observability. And it's it can be really complicated. Uh, and it's just so many options. But again, this is sort of like you you get to pick, you get to choose based upon what your needs are, based upon what your budget, your team culture is, whatever works for you. You might want to use, you know, effectively a CNCF stack and use Prometheus for metrics and maybe Zipkin uh, and Jaeger for tracing and use Fluentd for your logging. Uh, you might just want 
a lot of that in AWS managed services. So you might use, you know, uh, um, a CloudWatch for logging and, uh, and aggregation and visualization and using, you can use our Prometheus metrics actually. So you can mix and match too. Um, so there's a lot of options. So again, this is sort of one of those situations where AppMesh can make this easier for you and automate aspects of it, um, but it's not opinionated on what solution you choose. So in this case, just because it's easy to do, um, and right here, I'm gonna show just the integration with, with X-Ray. Um, but I actually did this earlier and uh, I kind of forgot to undo it. So I'm just gonna talk about what I did. Uh, this is how easy <laughs> it was to enable X-Ray. I mean, I might be able to fire that at it again, but it's, it's already enabled. So I'm just going to take this. Up, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, I can. Or two. Okay. Is that better? Probably. So let's just look at that real quick. So we had yesterday, we installed the controller and it installs through the Helm chart. So it has a number of configurable uh, you know, tunable things on it. One of them is whether or not you enable tracing. So if you set it to true, you actually get X-Ray by default. I just specified X-Ray just to make it really clear, but X-Ray is the default provider. But this could be, um, you know, Zipkin, this could be Datadog, this could be a lot of different things. And what this will do, just setting that string in the value in the Helm chart when you install it, is it will automatically inject those sidecars for you it will automatically set the environment variables for you in your containers. And so it just sort of automates all that stuff. Um, so this, again, this is like, you know you need tracing, you, you like X-Ray, you wanna use it, you have an option. You, you can go and modify all of your deployment specs to set those environment variables. You can define pods uh, to have the Envoy containers and I mean, uh, the X-Ray daemon containers in them. Like you can do all that, uh, manage your credentials, mount your credentials in, right? Or you can just let AppMesh do it for you. Um, that's really what we're talking about. So as I said, we, are, we already kind of did this. So um, I think I can just drive some traffic at this for now. We also, um, we also uh, had enabled, I, I deployed Fluentd and enabled the CloudWatch integration there as well. So we, we have logs going, which I'll look at, we'll look at in a second. Uh, just export this again. Drive some traffic at that. Oh, oh yeah, I just wanted to show really quickly. Um, if YAML is not your thing, which you know it probably is if you're a Kubernetes user, and, and we talked about the power of that, but all of this is in the console as well. So you can jump into your mesh and kind of click through and see all of your virtual services, nodes, routers. Here is our gateway. Um, and then the gateway routes are actually embedded in that. So you can see everything really clearly also through API, through the CLI. Um, so right now let's go, actually let's let's peek at CloudWatch real quick because like I had said, I had enabled this. This is as simple as just deploying Fluentd like you always do. Um, and and then setting some environments uh, um, on on your virtual nodes, and everything will will end up routing over here. So you have a, a basically you've got data plane and host stuff just like you you do with a cluster, and then application is going to have uh, effectively all of all of your services. Um, and let me make this a little easier to see. So we he see here, for example, we have uh, the white service, and that's the X-ray daemon. And there's the Envoy, and then you have the application logs as well. So you you're uh, free to uh, sort of configure how much gets logged and where it goes. But this gives you a constant stream of all of the various components of um, your application. So here we're just going to look at the white service and its Envoy. So this is actually the Envoy container that's running in, and just uh, sort of tracking all of its uh, behavior. And so it's it's effectively, I had to do nothing, right? I, I just enabled it uh, and put Fluentd in place and, and uh, the rest of it sort of happens. So, and I wanted to show X-Ray as well, very similar. So as we said, we just enabled it uh, with the Helm chart installation and it's gonna compute this map here. So, um, 
So all of this is with no instrumentation in my service code at all. So this is just what you sort of get as far as <laughs> tracing visibility. Um, there's there's something good going on. I don't know what that is. <laughs> just keep going. You're good. I'm I'm going. I'm I'm just yeah. really curious as to what's going on up up there. I'm literally beat red right now. I just you realized. Yeah, it's all you're good. good. So so I just wanted to show you. Now I'm laughing. Is, I don't even know why. This so, is doing it live. This is what. So it's this all is about. our ingress. Yeah. So this is our ingress service. This is our ingress gateway. And you can see um, all of the services are, are, are getting traffic from the ingress. Um, and if you haven't used X-Ray before, so you know, effectively, this is a visualization of what's happening in your, uh, in this case, in my mesh, but in your application at any point in time. So we can see the flow of traffic. And it, it resolves and gets better over time as far as, uh, so this is, this is driven basically by active traffic, right? So over time, this becomes a little more sane to look at, but you can see the ingress is coming in. And then for example, coming into this uh, Envoy proxy, which then goes to this application service. And so at any stop along the way, we can actually get metrics, uh, both average metrics, but we can also you know dig down and sort of see what's happening on a, a particular instance. Um, and what's quite nice is actually the, the um, analytics where it actually gives you sort of a top-down uh, uh, look at just sort of the overall health of your application. Um, so this is, you know, it's, I don't want to talk too much about X-Ray in particular, but I want to make it clear that all we did uh, was deploy our services in App Mesh and enable tracing. Um, obviously, for complete end-to-end -end application tracing, you're going to instrument your code. You're going to take advantage of that really um, uh, a great API for for doing that, but this you get sort of for free, where you can yeah. sort of see like how the traffic is doing uh, and the health of the services. So, so pretty, on pretty that, cool. I think kind of a similar to the to uh, your point, Texan Raj asks, how do you enable X-ray on a normal deployment without mesh? And yeah. any pointers would be helpful. Do you want to sure. tackle that? Yeah, I think I, I mean I sort of glossed over it before in, in eight seconds. So um, it it's in the X-ray uh, user guide. There's there's a documentation on how to do this. It's a sort of a two-step process. Uh, as part of your deployment spec, you will specify the X-ray daemon container, and then in your application, you're going to uh, export the um, on uh, the X-ray tracing environment variable. And so those two things together um, will will actually get you configured to start generating traces. Um, and then, you know, with the service, obviously the managed service uh, X-ray will will pick them up. That's that's the endpoint that they get sent to. Uh, with Envoy, uh, in all of our pods, we actually have a little bit of more flexibility as far as you know what we're working with, what type of tracing data is generated, and where it gets sent to. But you know, in a nutshell, like. Kind of winding back to just X-ray, yeah, it's completely integrated, works really well. Uh, App Mesh just automates it for you. The cool thing about using App Mesh here is that just turning it on, you can choose different providers, right? Yeah, totally. All right, you guys good? Yeah. Are you are you <laughs> laughing? All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I did. No, it's cool. It's good. It's uh. It's, so Not I, laughing I at you at all. Yeah, oh, just I, yeah, I yeah. So. Okay, all right, yeah. It's completely just something I I caught after. It's just uh, anyway. Let's keep going. All right. Well, let's yeah. So let's. I I feel like we can. I could, as you guys can tell, I could just talk about this forever. And if I'm not giving like a talk, I have no organization. So I'm just gonna start just like all this stuff. So I, I'm just gonna stick to the demos so we can get through them at least. But Absolutely. if you have any questions, just fire you know fire away. Um, I did want to show another uh, sort of big problem set in a specific uh, example of, of one of the solutions. So resilience is, is really important. Um, so, you know, obviously observability is important and there's so many aspects to that. There are whole books written on that, right? Uh, resilience is the same. Resilience is another big bucket category. And, um, you know, there, there are so many kind of war stories about, you know, 
working with flaky downstream services or you know not you know, having you know two different passes of code that were slightly different and they're behaving differently and and they weren't caught in code review and now you have different behaviors for different uh, customers and just all sorts of different stuff out there um you know from our past and adopting microservices at scale that there's just a lot of pain around resilience um and so at mesh and, and other service meshes as well uh we uh offer a set of features around that so one of the things i'd like to show is retries so you can take any piece of code that you have in your existing microservices and let's face it you probably have many microservices delivered by different teams maybe implemented in different languages everybody's handling this slightly differently you can take all of your retry loops every loop that you have that says oh did i fail fine, let's try again in five seconds. Let's try again in 10 seconds. You can take all of that code out and just put it in your app mesh configuration. And it's literally like three or four lines of YAML when you're working in Kubernetes. So we can take a look at... Um, and actually, you know, when I think about that's so now we've talked about two places where I'm able to take away, remove code from my, like from my actual code and let app mesh handle it. X-ray being one, yes. right? Yes. Instrumentations handled via app mesh. Um, and then uh, two now adding retries there. Let's let's clarify on that particular first thing that you said uh, because Wari twenty one uh, is that maybe no never mind. Did I catch this right? When I use App Mesh, I don't have to change my application code to enable X ray tracing. This is great stuff. The answer is mixed. Um, yep. It's it's you can enable X ray tracing and you can get. Uh, down as granular as traffic coming into your application and into your in individual service and then traffic exiting your individual service. But if you want even more uh, insights into what's happening inside the code, that's when you need to instrument your code and have, yeah. have it export stuff to X-Ray. Right. So there's still benefit and you can still see what Jesse showed us with the with the trace uh, graphs and, and all that stuff. And that's still really cool. Um, but if you wanted to see like how much time was spent in a particular function, um, it, you know, in that case, yeah, you're gonna have to like go deeper and actually instrument the code there. Right. Good so that's point. what we Thank call you. it in, in old, uh, so I don't know if people still do this, but functional boundary testing or TNF tracing, you know? So that's what we think of is you have a functional boundary for free. Right with the with the integration that I just showed because the the application code is not modified so everything that I just showed in X ray you do get um, but like we said you may want to and should uh, look to instrumenting particular problem areas because with observability what you're really doing is that tracing is that middle glue that connects an anomaly or outlier in metrics to the particular log that's going to help you triage an issue tracing glues those together. You know, you notice that uh, every Tuesday at 2 a.m. there's a spike in latency and your metrics will show you that. That's your first indicator, there's a problem. Traces are what enable you to go and say, okay, at that particular moment in time, let's look at the entire stack for a particular request. And maybe you're going through 15 or 20 different endpoints. You've got a you know, database at the back end, you have various microservices. So you're gonna find in that stack oh, well, the, the typical baseline for this service is 300 milliseconds and it took five seconds. Well, let's go look in there. And then you drill in and you find a log and this is, oh, the database timed out. And you find out that somebody's running a migration or something and, and there you go. So tracing is very important to glue your logs to your metrics. You know something's wrong. You know there's a piece of data that can show you what it was and the traces bring you there. So sometimes, depending on how modular your functions are, and in, functions being the abstract term. So your microservices or your containers, um, sometimes function boundary testing is enough. If you have 10 microservices and they all do exactly one thing and you can put a span together, that's great. Probably not though. And that's where you look at using those APIs uh, for say X-Ray or for Zipkin and Jaeger, and, you know, sort of looking to, to make the, that set of trace data more rich. I like the way you put that. That's really good. And it's a good thing to point out how smaller services uh, that are broken down and simplified, maybe those, you know, those you don't have to actually uh, instrument as much or at all. Mm -hmm.
That's exactly. good. That's a good point. Um, so I just wanted to show this, this what we we're talking about before. So we're gonna talk about retries. Um, here's an example of, say, say there's an application that's running and it's just, it's got some flaky downstream service. So we see a lot of 503s coming through. Um, and so in your code, you would say, oh yeah, well, let's just retry it a few times and you know, eventually kick the bucket. Or maybe you'll do a, 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 you know, a back off retry loop. Um, so I just wanna show how uh, quite easy this is here to, um, to specify a retry. So this right here is, is all we add. So this is on the virtual router specification for a particular route. And it's uh, this is a retry policy. We're gonna say that we're gonna retry a maximum of four times. And per retry timeout, we're gonna wait. And this is why, right? So two seconds here and a server error is gonna be the reason for firing this retry. So this gives us you know, effectively the space. I know that's very tunable and it's well documented, so we can look at various things, but this is a pretty simple one. And you can just apply this. And what will happen is we'll see some of these 503s start to go. It'll take a moment because what this is, is the Kubernetes, you know, it's almost already taken effect. So the Kubernetes controller is going to suck up those changes, re reflect them in the App Mesh API, the API, and you can see it's already taken effect. The App Mesh API uh, is going to apply that into the service. The service is going to say, "I have Envoy pre proxy changes. Send that out." And in your data plane, right alongside your application, it's going to get new information. So, oh, I've got new directive. I'm going to retry these, and now we see the 503s are gone. Right? That is that is an awesome demo, by the way. As someone who has had to fight with uh, tracking down errors and and uh, fight with uh, figuring out what unit of measure a retry might have been written to use. I loved seeing in your YAML that it actually called out the unit as milliseconds. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. I can't tell you how that has, how many times I've been bitten by someone doing it in milliseconds and someone else doing it in seconds. And, you know, there's even, um, <laughs> what's microseconds, I think. So, like, it's just, oh, my gosh. I love seeing that. Um, it looks so easy. And then when you applied, I mean, it wasn't, mm -hmm. it was like a second later that, that it yeah. had already yeah. taken effect. That is so fast. Considering you applied it to the Kubernetes controller, which then has to reach out to the AWS API to make the change which then has to recalculate the new uh, configs and push those down to the Envoy proxies that are running on your cluster. So that whole round trip was about a second. I mean, that's exactly. that's pretty impressive. That's pretty cool. And I've, you know, I've shown that before and then shown it exactly again, because I don't think it's, it, it's a good demo and it shows you exactly where, but, th but that really is how it works. It's that simple. And so, you know, if you decide that, yeah, this, this vendor's got this service that we really, we're gonna need to repurpose and we're really having even more failures. You just push that in YAML, right? And it just applies to whatever service routes you need it to. Um, so you're not now chasing, changing that back off loop that we all have in all of our microservices, you know, across two or 300 services, right? It's, it's uh, it really simplifies things. Yeah, Very powerful. Um, I love that. We did, I think we had some interest yesterday also in traffic shifting. So we're going to look at just some some stuff beyond. So in the demo yesterday we did, we put a new version out and we, I think we did a canary to a new version. Yep. Um, and so I was just going to show how easy that is at a, a slightly larger scale. Not that this is a more production-like application than DJ app, but it does have uh, some more moving parts and it does give us a little bit more opportunity. Um, so yeah, let me see what we're going to do here. I have my notes right here. I'll just share them right with you. See that? Oh, right. So this was, so I wanted to talk about, um, I dropped a semi. I wanted to talk about something we did mention yesterday was A-B testing. So I think this is, this is really powerful. And just coming from a, an engineering background, a product development background, um, being able to sort of specify um, a set of, 
uh, criteria that would drive a user toward one versus another endpoint. Uh, so you can actually have two groups of users or multiple groups of users testing different versions of the software. Um, and you could, if, you know, being able to modify that just sort of in your infrastructure config is, is pretty powerful. Um, so the example I said yesterday that I think resonated was, uh, you know, you maybe have an alpha group and a beta group. And depending on header content, they would get different, um, you know, different results, or they'd be running on different versions of the software. Um, so that's this is an example of that. Um, can't talk and type at the same time. I really have a. I should be better <laughs> at that. Um, this is just an AB where um, what we're doing is we're deploying a second set of the service or a second version of the service, and it's going to have. Um, you know, a different behavior. And now 50% of the time through this endpoint, you're getting the other version, which is, as you can see, it's louder. So we have blue and then we have a louder blue, right? So, but it's just that simple. Um, and we do that through uh, weighted, um, we do that through weighted targets, like we were talking about uh, yesterday. So right here, we see it's just as simple as saying, well, your weight's gonna be 50%. Um, and then your weight for the other one is going to be 50%. And you define these through their virtual node references. And so what we did is we put a, a louder uh, deployment out there that returns the all caps blue, and it's represented by a virtual node named blue louder. And now we have uh, weighted uh, traffic going 50% to each of those. That's pretty and great. So, yeah, it is. It's it definitely and makes things. Uh, and you could A-B test using that kind of mechanism. And then even if you wanted to control it and say like, you know, have one customer's traffic be uh, in the A group and a different customer's traffic be in the B group, you could yes. break it up, uh, you know, by having that customer, once they log in, that you, you set a custom header on their traffic. Exactly. And yep. then route based on that custom header. That would be yep. awesome. And you could do it You could do it all the way right down to user ID. Um, mm -hmm. You could use it to divert, uh, say, I like I like the example of beta testers, right? To say, oh, well, you're a beta tester. You're part of this program. You get this content. And you yeah. can very easily do that. Put it in their control and inside their preferences panel, slide, you know, slide on the, the I'm willing to beta test feature and they can slide it off at any point and uh, based on the presence of that, route to any beta um, you know, services. That would be really cool. Exactly. And, and you don't have to change any of your, you know, your front end code, your client code. That's pretty powerful. Um, so just to show this at a slightly larger scale, uh, I've deployed a louder version of all the colors. And I've also, um, we still have our blue running, but I, we haven't touched any other configuration. So all of our traffic is still going to our existing deployed services. But if we would like to, um, so we could do, this is sort of a, a more of a blue green deployment compared to yesterday's canary. So we can actually say, okay, well, let's start turn, it will send 25% of our traffic to the new versions. And yeah. it's as simple as those weighted targets, right? And it's just saying, we're going to uh, move, you know, 25% to the new versions. And now we see they're starting to come through. We have a little louder red, a little louder green. Um, and I know I could probably type this faster than cutting and pasting, but don't trust me. <laughs> no, it's all um, good. So we can crank it up a little more. And you see it doesn't take long, like you had said. So this, again, this is us talking to the Kubernetes API. Kubernetes API lands these object changes. The controller notices it reflects the changes through the API into the app mesh service. App mesh service grocks that, turns that into Envoy config, sends it out to the data plane. It's all very simple uh, and quite easy. I mean, simple yeah. for you. It's fairly complicated for us, but it's simple for you as the customer. And, and can we just talk about the, what we've done today? So you took tracing, and yes, I, I totally understand. You know, when we want to get our application performance monitoring, of course, we're going to want to enable tracing in our app. But we took tracing into App Mesh took that responsibility to give us a good sense of tracing. Um, you took our deployment logic, and now App Mesh is handling our deployment logic, so we can do more creative deploys, safer deploys. 
I mean, now the one thing we didn't get to today was was TLS, but I know that yeah. TLS is, uh, of course, there's there's a couple more steps with ACM or certificate manager to get that mm-hmm. enabled, but that's another thing we can offload for service to service communication and encrypting that that communication. That's I mean, right. and then the first one, which my mind is going blank, but yeah, I mean, it's like the in so ingress is ingress. a completely ingress. new you know, completely new set of functionality. And we just rolled that out this week. But the other stuff is all, you know, helping you solve problems east west. Uh, Once the traffic is already in your services, and you're talking about, you know, between services. So now to be able to layer that in with traffic that is coming in from from the outside and and have all the same functionality, and it's as trivial as adding an option in your Helm deploy, you know, like just add yes. another additional line, and enable TLS, tracing. TLS is as simple as, for example, the retry policy that I showed. It's just a few lines of YAML or uh, or CFN and, and with, you know, with ECS, it's equally supported between the two orchestrators. It's super easy. And we have an integration with ACM, so the certificate manager. So you can set it up such that you create your certificate once, you set your policy, and when things are about to expire, everything just automatically generates, rolls over, pushes out your new certs, completely yep. avoiding uh, some some outages we've heard of uh, in in the recent <laughs> past, right? So yeah, it's, exactly that's some why outages we built I may have like been that. a part of. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, I think this might be our last question, but uh, from Texan Raj, uh, do you have an agenda on what's coming up on your upcoming sessions? The answer is no. We maintain kind of a loose uh, list of things that we plan to talk about. And the reason we do that is because we want to stay flexible and be able to, you know, kind of decide as we go. So uh, definitely hit us up. Thank you, Adam. Uh, On Twitter, real Adam J. Keller and Brent Contained with your ideas of what you want to see. And we'll take those and we'll throw them on our list. And then as we, you know, as we're thinking of stuff to talk about, uh, we just pick stuff off that list. So uh, today and yesterday was actually from, uh, you know, I think it may have been Nethole uh, who wanted to see, no, it was mm-hmm. JJ uh, somebody. Oh. I can't, I can't remember his username. Uh, but yeah, he wanted to see more about, uh, you know, advanced networking topics and, and that sort of thing. So and he had a big list, so we're still working on it. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but that said, like, uh, we're, you know, that's how we, that's how we think of stuff. So uh, anything that you're wanting to see or are curious about, uh, send us a request and we'll try and work it into the show. And with that, uh, any parting words? Big thank you to Jesse for joining us yesterday and today. I think thanks you for having me. Brought an awesome element to the show. This was really in depth. Super awesome. Thank you. Yes. Call me Mike TV. <laughs> <laughs> right on. We're really, yeah. Really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Cool. All right. Thanks. All everyone. right. Thanks everyone, and we'll see you next week, Monday. <laughs>